IACST 1052 students. This is Doug Fletcher with the second of our series of Excel videos on simulation. Now, in our first video, we addressed generating random numbers um, in general, and we didn't talk about probability distributions, but generally when people talk about generating random numbers, they're assuming that the distribution implied is uniform. So if we say, oh, I want a, a random integer from one up to 10, we mean that all of those possible integers are equally likely to occur. And of course, that's a specific probability distribution. Similarly, if we want a, a fractional random number um, between zero and one, we typically assume we're talking about a uniform distribution. But something that happens very frequently in actuarial work and statistical work more generally is that we want to generate random observations from some other distribution. Now, just as a little bit um, of a review, um, I'm going to uh, going to share my screen and we'll look at a brief review of our random number generation in the first video. Um, and so the main target in the first video was getting to our rand array function, which as I pointed out is extremely versatile. Uh, and what I have set up here at the moment um, is a, a call to rand array. Um, I'm taking the number of rows from cell B2, which at the moment simply has a value of one. So we're getting a single value. It's going to be in a single column um, and it's confined in a range from zero, the minimum, up to one, the maximum. And we don't want integers, so we're saying false for this last parameter here. So we're getting fractional values between zero and one. Um, and here I'm generating a um, normal random variable. But before we have a look at that, we need to do a little bit of theory here. Now, this is something that you'll do um, and get a proper dose of theory uh, in relation to your statistics studies in mathematical statistics. But just for a very brief review, um, here we're going to have a look at a, um, the probability distribution for a normal random variable. Uh, and so here we've got two graphs. The top graph is the density function for a standard normal variable with mean zero and variance of one. And the bottom graph is the cumulative distribution function for that same variable. So the cumulative distribution function gives you the probability of getting a value up to and including some x value. So if we say up to and including zero, um, what are we going to, what's the chance of getting something in that range? We read across onto the vertical axis and the value is in fact exactly a half. And this makes sense because we know that for a standard normal variable, exactly half the distribution is below zero and half is above zero. Now, doing an inverse function on a probability distribution means that we start from a probability and we use that as input and we bounce that off the cumulative distribution function and then read off the result from the x, x or horizontal axis. So if we want to look at um, a, a probability of 0.4 and we want to say, right, um, what's the normal distribution value corresponding to a cumulative probability of 0.4, we take that 0.4 we bounce it off the cumulative distribution function um, and we end up with a value round about 0.3 or something like that. Now, doing simulation from a normal distribution really is exactly the same as taking random values, that is uniform random values on zero to one, and then bouncing those off the cumulative distribution function and taking the resulting X value. Right, and that's exactly what we do. Now, you'll do the mathematics of that in your um, STAT 1371 unit, um, but this that's just a very brief recap um, how, of how it looks in a graphical sense. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. 
So Excel provides um, inverse functions for most of the probability distributions. And so here, what I have is norm.inv. Um, the first uh, parameter here is the probability. Um, so this is where we put in our value from the uh, random rand array. So I'm just referring to cell A4. And I've got this um, hash at the end of that reference, which says when we generate more values, take all the rest of the values as well. Um, and then I'm providing here the mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution from which we are generating these random values. And here I'm using a standard normal distribution with mean of zero and uh, vari variance standard deviation of one. Okay, um, and as before, um, the rand, uh, rand array function is a volatile thing. So each time we recalculate this, it pops out a different normal, um, normal inverse from that. Um, and just by coincidence, these two values happen to be very similar. Um, and we've got a rand array of nearly 0.8. And this gives us a, uh, a normal variable of around about 0.8. Let's just have a look on our um, cumulative distribution function. So if we're around about 0.8 here, a little bit less, and we track this across, um, and then we come down onto the x-axis, that's where we end up, around about 0.8. But of course, we're typically going to do this for um, not just one value, which obviously will will jump around all over the place. Um, we're going to do this for quite a few values, typically. Um, and if we get up to 100, um, then we start to see something, a distribution that looks roughly like a normal distribution, um, but it still jumps around a lot. And you don't really get um, a stable sense of the distribution until the um, size of the sample you're simulating is quite large. So here I've gone to 10,000, and this gives us a very stable histogram. You'll see slight variations as I recalculate each time, but really you'd look at that and you say, that histogram looks like a normal distribution. Okay, so that's how we do that. Now, just to note, um, rand array here, um, that one command is generating this whole list of 10,000 values. And then for norm.inv, this one command is taking all those 10,000 values, that is cell A4 with everything else that comes with it, um, and then doing the norm.inv. And so you've got just two commands there, um, and that's generating 10,000 normal random variates. Okay, now it's just slightly different in relation to um, discrete distributions, so we'll go and have a look at those now. So here's a very similar situation um, looking at a, um, a discrete distribution simulation. Um, here I'm using a binomial distribution. And I happen to be using a binomial with a sample size 10 and a probability of success of 0.3. But I'll just um, scroll that back up. Um, and just to see what that looks like, we'll come to my um, probability distributions screen and go to binomial where I'd set this up before. We've got 10, but we need to get down to uh, 0.3 uh, for the probability of success. Now, we need to treat discrete distributions separately from the continuous ones because the continuous, dis sorry, the cumulative distribution function looks quite different. It goes in steps. Um, and so what happens is um, really, if we drew this mathematically, these vertical lines would have no width, but we have to give them some width so we can see them. Um, and you can get the value zero with a probability of around about 0.3-ish, um, but you can't get a smidgen less than zero or a smidgen more than zero. You can only get exactly zero or one or two, et cetera, between zero and 10. Um, and so the cumulative distribution function um, looks like this. Value, um, it, it has a sudden jump up at exactly zero. It jumps up from um, 
a cumulative distribution function value of zero up to the height of this first density around about um, 0 0.03. And then it stays at that until it bumps into one. And then it jumps up again um, by the height of the um, probability mass, the chance of getting exactly one, um, which as we see is around about 0.12 and so on. And so you have these steps and stairs. And what it amounts to when we're doing um, generating random observations from such a distribution is that we want to bounce our um, uniform random variable um, off these the steps, off the risers, if you like, in this staircase. And so if our random variable hits the first step, um, then that will treat that as an observation equal to zero. If our random variable hits the riser for the second step, um, we'll treat that as an observation equal to one. And if the random variable hits the th riser for the third step, then we'll treat this as an observation equal to two and so on. Um, and that's that's how, how this function works for in the discrete case. So let, let's come back here. Um, so we've got a, um, a binom.inv um, and a rather annoying thing in Excel is that it's not consistent in how it organizes the arguments here. Um, so rather than having the probability up front, it wants the, it has the probability at the end here uh, and it gives it a different name. It calls it alpha for some reason. I've got no idea why it does that. Okay, so you've just got to be careful to read the little tips that you get when you start using these inverse functions or read the documentation. If they were all consistent, it'd be really good, but they're not all consistent. Okay, so um, for the binomial, we need to specify exactly which binomial it is. So the number of trials, that's the sample size, uh, 10 in this case, the probability of success, which is 0.3, and I had those up I'll just scroll back up so you can see those in the in the spreadsheet. Um, and then the last parameter in this case, what Excel calls alpha, is our probability um, from our rand array function. Okay, so that's how we're doing this in this case. Uh, once again, we have um, the A7 hash, which gets the rand array output plus extra values when we when we generate them. Okay, so this is getting random values from this binomial distribution. So it'll be a, uh, an observation between zero and one. Now let's just have a look and see how this works in relation to the staircase um, picture that we had before. So our random number here is 0.26, let's call it 0.25 because that's easy to imagine. And it returned a value of two. So if we look at our picture here, um, we've turned up a random value of about 0.26, so around about here, we come across here and that's hit the riser for the third step, uh, and that's going to return a random value of two, an integer two. All right, um, so that's how this works. Um, and then as usual, if we recalculated um, the uh, volatile random function, then that's going to jump around according to our distribution. Um, and our little histogram here cannot tell us the distribution unless we put in um, a decent sample size. So this starts to look something like um, our hypothetical distribution. Um, you'll notice in the real one, this is the mathematically exact distribution. It tapers off these, these frequencies at nine and 10. They actually exist, but they're very, very tiny. Um, so to to get anything turning up there, we'd really need to make this quite large. So if we go to 10,000, um, we'll start to see uh, maybe something tiny turning up up there. But the, these probabilities are down around about one in a million or something like that. Okay, so this is how our simulation works for a discrete case. Once again, it's all based on random numbers and you can get as many thousands of those as you want with the rand array function. Um, the binomial inverse, like the normal inverse, is happy to work with output from rand array. You get it all at once um, and it will return it all at once as an entire array using a single command. 
Now that completes our second video. We need to come back and look at this from the point of view of what if we've got a, a discrete distribution that is not um, some neat function? How do we actually organize that? And that'll be how we'll do it for the last video in the series. Okay, we'll see you then.